Praise the Lord. Good evening. Good to be home. Good to be with you. Glad you're here in the Lord's house. And uh, let's get started this evening. Let's stand and invite the Lord to have his way in this service for his glory. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Sister Rita Key, would you open in prayer, please, tonight? Amen. If you would uh, remain standing for this first song, I think we better stand for this one. I don't. It's not in the hymn book, I don't believe. But uh, how many of us know? I sing glory to your name. It's a fairly common song. I sing glory to your name, O Lord. Um, okay. Well, we'll just have to start out uh, a cappella, maybe, and then maybe the uh, piano will catch on. Let's start it out. I sing glory to your name, O Lord, glory to your name, O Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. I sing glory to your name, O Lord, glory to your name, O Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. Let's try this time except for change it to praises. I sing praises to your name, O Lord, praises to your name. may be seated. Turn back to number four, page number four in the hymnals. And good to see this group here tonight. Let's just praise the Lord. Let's glorify his name tonight. Amen. 
Amen. I pray that that's our heart's prayer tonight. As we turn over to 457, page number 457, and we just want to set aside all the distractions tonight. I know many of us have had busy work days and busy weeks and just the summer is coming on and all of these different things, but I think God deserves our whole attention tonight and our whole praise and glory to him tonight. So let's, let's just focus in on these last couple songs as we give glory to him tonight. Amen. 457. to go to the Lord in prayer together. We're going to just move right into that, but I do want to give a moment to highlight any special needs that uh, you want to reference. While you're thinking, uh, I want to praise the Lord for the camp there in Missouri that the Spiveys were able to be a part of. God moved in a marvelous way. Thank you for your prayers, and thank you for your faithfulness here. Uh, appreciate that and those who filled in and were a part we want to be lifting for the benefit uh, for Stephen Smith that's happening this Saturday and pray that it's a success in every way and that um, not only are many funds raised, but ultimately that Stephen is a testimony of God's healing, grace, and power. Uh, most of all, that he's a testimony of God's grace. Amen. And whatever all the Lord would have in that. And so let's be, I'm asking you and me, to join together freshly as we move into these final three days. Some of you have really worked at this and uh, 
May God bless you for it. And uh, we'll be having a meeting after the service tonight. We'll talk more about it a little later. But let's be praying over this. And then, of course, Camp Victory is right around the corner. And uh, we're praying that it is of a victorious nature. And that God helps each one to not only be there, but be obedient uh, to the call of the Spirit. And uh, appreciate those that are maybe already praying over it. But let's be praying and fasting for that in the coming days. I know there are many unspoken requests, give you opportunity for those right now. And then, um, Carol, go ahead. Sure. Let's be praying for Jonathan. Jonathan has COVID. There are many battling that, Brother Bolas, who had to cancel for Camp Victory. I know as of last, end of last week, he uh, didn't have fever, but he was battling low oxygen levels. And uh, I haven't, don't have an update, but let's be praying for him and others. Man. Anyone else, prayer request, praise report that you would have us before we go to the Lord together? Thank you, Daddy. Anyone else? Good. Good. Okay, let's pray over Shani. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Let's pray for hungry hearts to be drawn to the Lord. Let's pray that our hearts will be drawn to the Lord freshly. Amen. I'm asking you to find a place to kneel. If you can't kneel, reverently bow your head. But let's go to the Lord together this evening. Heavenly Father, I do thank you that um, you, you know our greatest needs. And his name is Jesus. I thank you today for a wonderful Savior. I thank you for a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. I thank you for the God of all grace, the God of all comfort. I thank you that, Lord, 2,000 years ago, you sent our answer, you sent our solution, you sent our help, and his name was Jesus. And thank you that today we have access to Jesus through the Holy Spirit as we come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. And today we recognize that we are a needy people. Lord, you know my needs today, some that I have expressed. And Lord, I bring those needs to the foot of the cross today. Oh, Lord, Lord, I bring them to you. Lord, that you might bring direction and help and guidance and victory and strength and clarity. Oh, God, I bring it to you. And Lord, there are a dozen or so others, Lord, there here tonight that need to be doing the same thing. And thank you that you've invited us, Lord. You've invited us to cast our care upon you, for you careth for us. Thank you, Lord, tonight that you're the great burden bearer. In fact, Jesus, you declared clearly that, Lord, those who are heavy laden, those who are burdened, can come not to themselves, come not even just to the church, uh, but they can come unto you. And you promised rest for their souls. Uh, I thank you that whatever life may bring through the Holy Spirit, uh, through the grace of God, you have proven enough. Hallelujah. And so we take advantage of that tonight, Lord. I pray that every heart, Lord, that has entered with a burden, that has entered with a question mark, that has entered, Lord, uh, 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 with, with uh, Lord, a heaviness. I ask that tonight they would, Lord, cast the burden upon you, that they would, Lord, set it at the feet of Jesus, that, that they would know, Lord, your comfort, that they would hear a word in due season, uh, that they would know that there is overcoming grace, uh, there is, uh, 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 Lord, there is clarity, there is just what is needed, and I pray this, I pray this over every young person and child, I pray this over every adult, I pray it over every marriage, uh, I pray it over every relationship, I, I pray it over every grieving one, uh, I pray it, Lord, over those, Lord, who need to know saving power. I pray that for it over those that, that Lord, are struggling to know, Lord, of your sanctifying grace. I, I pray it over those, oh God, uh, who've been walking with you, but they need renewal. They need strength from above. I pray over them and for them. I pray, oh God, that we would not turn to the right hand or, or turn to the left, but may we walk the highway of holiness, the road of righteousness today. Uh, oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Strengthen your own today. Strengthen your own in Jesus' name. 
I come to you. We come to you tonight uh, in Jesus' name. We pray over the requests that were mentioned through upraised hand. Lord, we recognize that these, many of them are heavy burdens. And God, we pray over them. Some of them are family members. Some of them are loved ones. Uh, some of them are neighbors, Lord, or crisis situations. And I pray that in each and every one of them, Lord, that, that you would work in a definite and real way to bring victory. To bring victory. Hallelujah. I pray, oh God, Lord, over Jonathan Groom, Lord, and, and I pray for a healing touch upon his body. We pray, Lord, over Brother Bolas, Lord, and a healing touch upon him. Lord, we pray, oh God, over those that have not been able to be here and are shut ins, Lord, and I pray you'd strengthen and encourage them in Jesus' name. We pray for continued grace, Lord, uh, and comfort for Sam Brimer and, and Lord, the, 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 the uh, key family. Lord, minister to them. Lord, in an ongoing way, we pray in Jesus' name. Lord, we're especially lifting, Lord, Stephen Smith to you in this week. We recognize, oh God, that he, Lord, is in a season, Lord, that, that many of us can hardly relate to. But, Lord, he's walking it. And, and, and I thank you that you're a high priest. Uh, Jesus, you're a high priest that can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. And I pray that over Stephen and his precious family today. I pray for the healing power of God most of all. Lord, we come again. We pray again, asking for the healing grace of God. Lord, I'm asking, Lord, for the team that's working together for the success of this benefit. I pray, oh God, that you would cause it to be something that people would rally around and, and may Stephen and his life and his testimony and his family, Lord, radiate out a, a, a glorifying of God, I pray. I pray that many funds would be raised and they would help fund uh, help and treatment, Lord, for days to come. For days to come, we pray in Jesus' name. We're asking, oh God, that you would minister, Lord, to Shani and, and others, Lord, that are struggling. I pray, God, that you'd bring a healing body, soul, and spirit in your precious name. Thank you for this time together this evening. Thank you for a gathering of the believers, a gathering of the saints. Lord, we value it and we ask, oh God, we ask, oh God, that it might serve to the advancement of your kingdom in each and every life. All of this we ask in Jesus' precious, holy, mighty, matchless name. And all God's people said, amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'm having Blake and Wyatt come up front if they will. And we're going to bring Missions March offering to you this evening.
Amen and amen. Thank you for your giving. And uh, I did fail to mention, uh, many of you know Ravana. She's attended here various times. In fact, recently our church helped Chris and Ravana LaRue. And uh, Ravana, her father passed away. Uh, he was battling cancer, uh, as I understand it. And, and I've been asked to have the funeral tomorrow evening. And so I appreciate your prayers for that, that I can li make much of Jesus and somehow bring a comfort to that family. So let's be praying for Ravana and her family uh, in this time of loss. Praise the Lord. I want to emphasize um, uh, some things. Some of you probably referenced this from Sunday, but I want to emphasize uh, birthdays and anniversaries. Diane Brady had a birthday. Uh, Ricky Grubbs had a birthday. Uh, Kylie Fields, that would be Brandon's daughter. Uh, she has a birthday today. Mike and Darlene Taylor had an anniversary. And Kenny and Darlene Rice had an anniversary. And so uh, if Kenny got it right, it was 35 years. Is that right, Darlene? Well, he told me 35. I had, I had congratulated him, and now I'm going to have to get on him. All right, so uh, we congratulate all of the above. And then uh, this afternoon, or excuse me, this evening after the service, immediately after the service, there is a group of people uh, headed to Fairview Elementary to cover some details with Stephen Smith, uh, the benefit for Stephen Smith this Saturday. Anybody who's been engaged and involved with that, you're welcome, and others are welcome as well. Uh, there'll be kind of a looking over the layout, maybe setting up some things, and then there'll be a time for all that want to. Uh, of some volleyball and ice cream here fellowship. Uh, uh, some may get started while some of the rest of us go to Fairview Elementary, um, and then we can come back here, those who would like to, and have some of that this evening. Um, the benefit is this Saturday from 4 to 7. Uh, it is both a benefit where you can come and purchase food. Of course, the idea in purchasing food is donation. And uh, some people will be able to put way more in than the food is worth uh, because the project is worthy. Uh, there will be items auctioned, I think both silent and public auction. Um, and so there'll be items and it's okay to bid more than the item's worth, right? <laughs> because there's a giving towards a worthy project. And uh, I, I made a post today, Matthew made a post, maybe others have made it or shared it, uh, but there's, looks like there's all kinds of items that will be uh, a neat thing to be offered in this. So let's come, uh, all that are able, and work in that. Now there is a Camp Victory work day, both Saturday morning and Monday morning. I know some of you won't be able to do all of the above. You choose what you need to be at, and that's okay, we understand. I'll be scurrying over there Saturday morning and scurrying back here Saturday afternoon. Uh, Lord knows uh, we're pressing forward, and uh, there just sometimes there's just too much on the calendar, and we press on. So praise the Lord. Uh, and then uh, I do want to emphasize Camp Victory beginning 7 o'clock Tuesday night, and it is just going to be a time of, well, a time of wonderful blessing. Uh, there's going to be good food. There's going to be good fellowship. There's going to be good preaching and teaching and singing. Uh, there's going to be good instruction. Uh, we're going to be having the Dickinson family speak to families about raising children. Uh, that's going to be happening. Uh, so just, just want to uh, encourage you to do your best to be at as much of it as you can. If that means you're staying there, Pastor Spivey says, praise the Lord. If you're not able to stay there and you have to do some driving back and forth, uh, we understand, but drive back and forth as much as you can. Uh, we want it to be a time of spiritual success and blessing. And mainly we do that by being there and being engaged. Praise the Lord. Any announcements I need to highlight? Any announcements I need to highlight before we move on? Great. Uh, there are going to be some drinks right after the service loaded up to be moved to the Fairview Elementary. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You're opening your Bibles to Luke chapter 7, but while you're turning there, is there anyone who wants to give a praise report? A 
praise report giving glory and honor to Jesus. Leela wants to praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'm going to switch mics, Caden. and the situation there in Dallas. Uh, probably most of you saw it on Facebook today or the other day. Uh, but it was a situation that could have ended pretty badly. Um, I probably won't go into detail right now, but I just, just do want to say that I'm thankful for the Lord's help and for his, uh, for his protection there. Amen, Royal. Right. We, we thank the Lord as well. Praise the Lord, Becca. Appreciate that. Praise the Lord. Caden, we switch over. Or Mark, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Definite answer to prayer. Hallelujah, darling. Amen. Amen. My Caden got spiritual help this week, and he's thanking the Lord for that. And I praise God as well. Hallelujah. An inheritance among them. Amen. By faith is in me. I just remembered a thing last night. I told Brother Lance, and it, it's so applicable. But a pastor, I forget his name, in, in the early 80s, at Bible Missionary Church in Portland, Oregon. God is greater than what's the matter. Amen. Praise the Lord. That was probably Larry Bailey. Huh? That was Larry Bailey, maybe. Everhart. A Joe Bailey. Joe Bailey, okay. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Anyone else? Remember, you do have to be breathing. Other than that, you're qualified to testify. Remember, I think a friend of mine was, he and his wife were in Destin, Florida, and he was on the way, they were on the way home, and he had, um, heart attack, and they thought it was related to some pneumonia that he had, that he didn't realize he had pneumonia, but anyway, he's been in the hospital for two weeks, and it was too bad to do the surgery, but he came through a triple bypass this morning, and will spend three days in intensive care, and another four or five days in the hospital, and then hopefully be, be home soon, so thank the Lord for helping him. Praise God. We join with you in that. Anyone else? Just thank the Lord for the encouragement of the Spirit. I thank him that you as you can read his word, how it can feed your soul, and that he can uh, speak to your heart and help you and encourage you so that you feel like as you go through the morning and through the day, his presence is right there with you, and I know it is. I praise him for all he's done for me. I don't know where I'd be without him. I'm thankful he's my father. Jesus is my elder brother, and he's a friend who stick up closer, closer than a brother. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise God, Mitch. I couldn't tell you who I passed. Right. I was focused completely. I was, oh, Lord, have mercy on our Amen. Side. Amen. And uh, I couldn't tell you who I seen in that store or who was there or whatever. Because I was totally focused. Praise God. And then about 15 or 20 minutes, Jeanette said, be really. Hallelujah. Praise God, Mitch. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Anybody here looking up? 
Hallelujah. I was reminded of those three words as I preached Sunday morning, looking unto Jesus. Hallelujah. Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7, we're going to verse 16. Luke chapter 7, verse 16. And there came a fear on all, and they glorified God, saying that a great prophet is risen up among us, and that God hath visited his people. Now they're talking about Jesus here, but we're getting ready to transition to talk about a different prophet. Uh, so the people recognize the hand of God through Jesus. God has visited his people, verse 17, and this rumor of him, Jesus, went forth throughout all Judea and throughout all the region round about. And the disciples of John showed him, showed John of all these things. Now it's important to note where John is. Anybody tell me who, where John is at this time? He's in prison. Sounds exciting. Sounds enjoyable. Uh, not really. He's in prison. So the disciples of John are showing him how the Lord is working through, um, the Lord is working through Jesus and the miracles. Verse 19, and John calling unto him two of his disciples sent them to Jesus saying, art thou he that should come or look we for another? You're gonna notice two of these. You want to take a minute and just, just, just look here. You're going to notice two of these. Not exclamation points. Not periods. You're going to notice in John the baptizer's report or, or, or message, there, there are two question marks. Can a Christian ever have question marks? I mean, what if you're a really, really, really good Christian? We're headed there. Let's keep reading. When the men, verse 20, when the men were come unto him, they said, John Baptist has sent us unto thee, saying... Art thou he that should come or look for, for another? And in that same hour, he, that's Jesus, cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of evil spirits. And unto many that were blind, he gave sight. Then, then Jesus answering said unto them, Go your way and tell John what things you have seen and heard, how that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, to the poor, to the poor, the gospel or the good news is preached. And blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended or caught in the devil's trap in me. Verse 24, when the messengers of John were departed, he began to speak unto the people concerning John. What went ye out in the wilderness for to see? A reed shaken with a wind. But what went ye out to see? A man clothed in soft raiment. Behold, they which are gorgeously apparelled and live delicately are in king's courts. But what went ye out to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and much more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. For I say unto thee, Among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. I'm stopping there. Asking or, or making this statement, How a saint dealt with doubt. How a saint dealt with doubt. Father, thank you for your word. May it not return empty this evening, but accomplish that to which you send it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. There are various interpretations of this passage as well as the sister passage found in Matthew 11. Here are some of them. First of all, John the Baptist asked this question because his own disciples needed strengthening. I disagree with that, but, but, but it is a possibility. Uh, uh, secondly, that John wondered whether Jesus was the great one because of his acts of meekness and mercy. I would lean more towards some of that. 
Number three, John's faith may have failed as a result of his being in Herod's prison for months with no action by Jesus to secure his release. Now think about that. What if you believed in Jesus and believed that he was the son of God and believed that he had all power and you were in prison for months and Jesus didn't visit you and he didn't deliver you? What would that do to your faith? <laughs> I mean, Jesus is related to him. <laughs> Not to mention, he's the great prophet, the, the, the concluding Old Testament prophet. I mean, Jesus obviously thinks highly of him, and, and people that you think highly of, don't you help them? I mean, would you try to help me if I was in prison, Lance? <laughs> Depending on what, what I was in for, maybe. But, uh, we know, that, we know that, that John was in for good reason. I mean, he was in for preaching the gospel. He was in for confronting sin. I really want this to sink in tonight because many times, and I'm, can I be honest with you? I'm preaching to Pastor Spivey too tonight. Many times we have good reasons for ending up with a question mark. Jesus didn't argue that John didn't have any good reasons. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. We live in a broken, hurting, challenging world. And frankly, Sometimes, from our vantage point, God doesn't seem to be coming through. And we're faced with some question marks, with some doubts. Now, now we're headed somewhere, but, but I want this to sink in. Because John, in his humanity, he probably had reason to think that Jesus was failing to live up to who John expected and believed him to be. Number four, John's patience may have failed, but not his faith in Jesus, because it says, you are the one we are expecting, aren't you? Then why not do something? You've probably never had that with the Lord. You know, Lord, I'm trusting you. You've given me the promise. You've said you can and would help. Okay, Lord, it, it, it's time. Now, I'm not talking about an unbelief. I'm going to make that distinction just a little bit. I'm talking about honest struggle, seeking to believe God, seeking to walk with God, seeking to have real faith, but it being tested and, and pressed upon and, and, and God not coming through in the way that you had hoped or believed that he would. Number five, John was puzzled. John had prophesied that the coming one would do some striking works of judgment. But Jesus was engrossed in works of mercy, and I very much feel that that has merit. Let me emphasize something. The Old Testament presented the Messiah as a two-fold character. Number one, they presented the Messiah as a suffering servant. Anybody remember reading Isaiah 53? Isaiah 53 talks about one who is wounded and bruised for our transgressions, and he's given stripes for our healing. And, and the scripture tells us that it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Let me just make it real plain. It was God's will for Jesus to be tortured and mistreated. It was God's will. And we struggle with that. We think God's will is make our lives better. Well, God was making our, our lives better, but he had to do it through the suffering of the Messiah. He had to do it through the suffering servant. And to this day, the Hebrew people, the Jews, grapple with Isaiah 53. To this day, they grapple with it. 
Does it mean a person? Does it mean a nation? They, they grapple to this day with Isaiah 53. And one reason they do is because the Messiah was not just prophesied to be a suffering servant. He was also prophesied to be a reigning king. Now, in Jesus' three and a half years of walking this earth, did he act like a king? Did he wear fine clothes? Did he hold out a scepter? Did he give commands and expect people to do them? Well, I, I know he did give some commands in regards to healing, etc. But did he act like a king? He didn't act like a king at all. In fact, just the opposite. He acted like a servant. He acted like an errand boy of God to show meekness and, and, and love and grace and mercy. But if you were a Jew under Roman oppression in the first century, you were not looking for a suffering servant. You were looking for a promised king. I'm gonna ask you a question tonight and I really want you to take this into your heart. Could it be possible that in some area of our lives, we're looking for God to do this when if we really heard his voice, he'd say, I'm doing this. We say, God, I expected, I wanted. That's what the first century, that's why the disciples struggled so much. I think that probably plays into John's struggle here. I think it plays into why he had a question mark, two question marks. Because Jesus was not living out what an Old Testament prophet primarily thought he was going to be. In fact, let's touch on that just a little bit. I invite you to John, keep a finger in Luke 7 if you would. I invite you to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. John is, uh, let's go to verse 14. John chapter 1 verse 14, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So that sounds wonderful. Verse 15, John, John the Baptist, bare witness of him and cried saying, this was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me for he was before me and of his fullness have all received and grace for grace. I want you to skip down uh, to verse 26. Verse 26, John answered them saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom ye know not. He it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoe latchet I am not worthy to unloose. These things were done in Bethabara beyond Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day, John seeth who? Who does it say there? John seeth who? Jesus coming unto him and saith, I wonder if this is the one we're looking for. What does he say? Help me out. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Is there any, help me out, any question mark there? No, no, it's a clear declaration. We could almost say there's an exclamation point there. Okay. John is in a moment of faith. He's in a moment of understanding he's in a moment of certainty and he says here's the one i've been talking about this is the gift of this is the one that made me jump in my mama's belly i know who he is he's the one i'm telling you about he's going to baptize you with fire and the spirit and and he's the one who's going to be sacrificed he's the lamb of god He's gonna be sacrificed for the sin of the world. That's an exclamation point. That's a period. And all of us, I'm afraid, would have to be honest and say, there are times when what was once an exclamation point, what was once a clear declaration, 
has now turned into a question mark. I felt like God was telling me to do this. But now, I was pretty sure that God was saying, I thought God was wanting to, and I hope the Holy Spirit in your mind is filling in the blank. And now, we're here. Now we're here. It's interesting to note that a man of John the Baptist's caliber reached a point of serious questioning. But, but, but let's make sure we understand some things about it, all right? You're going, as you turn back to Luke chapter 7, I want, you to, I want us to note the courage of the prophet, and, and I won't spend much time here, but just say this. <laughs> John the Baptist was indeed a courageous saint of God. In Mark chapter 6, it tells us that Herod had sent forth and laid hold upon John and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. For John had said unto Herod the king, Herod, it's unlawful for you to have your brother's wife. Therefore Herodias, the wife, had a quarrel against him and would have killed him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing he was a just man and a holy, and observed him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. I, I want you to catch this. Here's a king that can hold John's life in his hands. And, and eventually, through the treachery of Herodias, the, the woman who's upset, through the treachery of this queen, John's head is removed and, and offered on a platter. But Herod knew the kind of man John was and he trembled at him because he was a courageous prophet. He was a courageous prophet. But, but even courageous prophets move into season of crises. And John the Baptist in Luke chapter 7 is in a time of question mark. He's in a time of crises. Let me remind you, he wasn't the first one. Moses in Numbers chapter 11, dealing with this difficult group of people. Don't raise your hand, but have you ever dealt with a difficult person? Have you ever been that difficult person? In Moses, in Numbers chapter 11, Lord, I'm weary with this. What about David in 1 Samuel 22? He's been hunted. God's promised he's going to be king, but he's been hunted by Saul way too long. And David finally says, you know what? I'm going to get out from under this mess, and I'm going to go to the Philistines. Saul won't hassle me there. It was a tragic misstep in David's life. What about Elijah in 1 Kings 19, when he is physically, spiritually, emotionally exhausted. He's overdone it. All for God's cause. He's overdone it. And he gives in to fear because Jezebel's promising to take his life. And, and you remember what Elijah does in 1 Kings 19? He runs to the cave. And he says, God, you might as well kill me. You might as well take me home because... I'm the last one standing. By the way, never forget that when you're discouraged, you tend to paint the picture darker than it really is. Somebody needs to hear that again. When you're discouraged, you tend to paint the picture darker than it really is. Don't forget that. Tell yourself that. Okay? Ah, Jeremiah struggled as well. So, so, so John the Baptist has, has some good company. <laughs> Great men of God who reached points in their walk with God where they had a question mark. They were ready to throw in the towel. They were ready to ask God a, a sincere but pointed question. God, am I wrong? God, am I off track? God, are you off track? Whew. 
I, I feel like this is where I'm supposed to be tonight. Okay? I'm trying to wind it down. Oh, let's go to the confidence of the prophet. Now, now I appreciate this about the people of God. Because this message tonight is not for people. This is not for someone who's not walking with God. What I'm going to share with, what I'm going to wrap up in closing here, this message for you is, this message is not for you if you do not have a real walk with God. This message isn't for you. Now, there's other messages for you, but not this message. This message is for those who are genuinely walking with God. Your relationship with God is real. It might be in a season of challenge. It might be a season of crisis. There, there might be some question marks, but I'm speaking to those who have a real, definite walk with God. And what I appreciate about John the Baptist, and really what I appreciate about all of the saints of God who go through crises, is that even in the crises, there is an inner compass <laughs> that points them, that orients them back to God. Where did, where did Elijah run? Where did Elijah run? Yes, it was to the cave. But where was the cave? You might know. It was at the Mount of God. To me, that's significant. Elijah, in his despair, in his discouragement, in his depression, in his big question mark, even then, he runs to the Mount of God. He, he hides, but he runs to the Mount of God. And one thing I love about John the Baptist here, Luke chapter 7, is that John does not say, <laughs> Am I totally off track? Here's what I mean. He says, are you the one, Jesus? Now, he shouldn't have been questioning Jesus, okay? He's not right in that. But he says, are you the one, listen, or do we look for another? Can you hear? Can you hear the orientation of faith in John's heart, even though he's struggling with doubt? Catch this. He's saying, okay, I know God is true. Let God be true and every man a liar. Amen? I know God's promises from the Torah, from the Old Testament, are true. So did I just make a mistake and focus them upon Jesus? Because I know God's, God's going to be faithful to his word. And I love that. And friends, it's okay for us sometimes to say when we, in our times of crisis, God... Did I just hear it wrong? Because I know you're right. I know your truth. In fact, Jesus, you're the way, the truth, the life. Did, did I hear it wrong? And by the way, I'm here to tell you, many times the Lord will say, no, you didn't hear it wrong. I just want to lead you through this. I want you to trust me even when the circumstances are contrary I want you to walk in faith even when it looks like everything is wrong. By the way, how many of us can testify that we grew most through the hard times rather than the easy times? Most of us will testify that our best spiritual growth have come through seasons of difficulty, not ease. And yet we still don't like difficulty, do we? <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> the confidence of the prophet, and here's where I'm going to close. The confirmation to the prophet. John sends his disciples. They come and ask, Is he looking, are we looking for the wrong one? Je Jesus, are, are you not who John thought you was? You were. It's interesting that Jesus just keeps doing miracles. The scripture says, then Jesus answered. So, so Jesus waited a while. Have you ever had Jesus wait a while to answer your question? I mean, you wanted an answer right now. Jesus, tell me. <laughs> and he just kept working. And in the meantime, you're still in prison. 
It wasn't like Jesus snapped his fingers and the prison doors open. Jesus kept working and then he answered. And, and you don't really get this in Luke chapter 7 unless you maybe look at the margins in your Bible. But it's interesting that Jesus, in what he shared, he referenced two Bible passages, two Torah, Old Testament passages. Listen, know this, that regularly when you come to God with sincere, when you come to God with sincere questions, do not be surprised that in God's time, he sends you to his word. If you're wanting answers, go to the word in prayer. Go to the word. And Jesus, interestingly, interestingly, Jesus is referencing Isaiah 35. That's an Old Testament prophet. Isaiah 35, and it says, that the prophet of God, that we're referencing the Messiah, is going to strengthen weak hands. He's going to confirm feeble knees. He's going to open the eyes of the blind. He's going to unstop the ears of the deaf. Now that's probably, that's definitely not what the disciples were looking for. And it's probably not what John the Baptist was looking for. He was looking for more likely a reigning monarch. Yes, a lamb of God. But John the Baptist was ready for the kingdom of God to come. And here's Jesus mercifully working miracles and helping the lowest of the low. And it was also a reference, no doubt, to Isaiah 61. Anybody remember what Jesus' first message was in Luke chapter 4? His very first sermon. What did he read out of the Old Testament? Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He hath anointed me to preach deliverance to the captives. Open the eyes and interesting to even set at liberty those who are captive or bound. But guess what? That did not include John the Baptist. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. See, believer, what we're after is God's will and God's word and God's way. This is not about my will and my way, and my work. How many of you are seeking to be surrendered to the will of God in your life? Then, then we've got to know his will and walk in it. Even if that is contrary to my will, my understanding, my plan, my purpose. See, when we die to ourselves, that means we live unto God, which means his will. Now, I'm just going to tell you, <laughs> I love the latter part of Luke chapter 11, that, or Luke chapter 7 that we read. When he sends the, the disciples of John back to, to, to give him the word of God and to show him that Jesus is indeed fulfilling the word of God. You know what Jesus does? He testifies for John the Baptist. Could I just say it this way? Jesus said, I want you to know John the Baptist fulfilled the will and work of God. He did and lived exactly how my father wanted him to live. John the Baptist is my faithful servant. Now it doesn't get any better than God testifying for you. I'd love for my children to testify for me. I'd love for my wife to testify for me. I'd love for my church to testify for me. But it doesn't get any better than when God says, I believe in you. And did you know that for faithful saints of God, even ones that are working through seasons of question marks, there are moments in that pathway when the Lord says, I love you, child of mine. Child of mine, I am here to help you forward. I believe in you. You're believing me? I believe in you. I believe you are seeking to follow me, even with your question marks. I believe you're seeking to honor me. I believe in the steps of obedience that you are taking. That sounds a little strange, but that's really what Jesus was doing. He was saying, 
My father, I, we believe in John the Baptist. Even though he's in prison, even though he's struggling with some doubt, God, through Jesus, is affirming, confirming the life and testimony of John the Baptist. Any idea where John the Baptist went when his head was removed just probably a short time after this? Any idea where, G where John the Baptist went? <laughs> to be with the God that he served. But don't miss this. To be with the God that he served. But in his humanity, he had to ask some serious questions. Could I say it this way tonight? God can handle our questions. And I close with this very important distinction. Very important. There is a difference between a question and unbelief. There's a difference between a doubt and unbelief. And I'm closing with this, this information. A question is when you are fully seeking to follow God, but things do not seem to be going how you think they should be. And sometimes, even in the context of what you thought God told you. Let me tell you, God can handle your doubts and your question marks. Bring them to him. John did. I should. Unbelief. Unbelief is when we say, I believe this is God's will, but I'm too scared or I don't want to do it. That's different, friend. Sometimes they look similar. Sometimes they look similar, but they're profoundly different. One, if you will bring your doubt to the Lord, he's going to bring you through with victory. He did for John the Baptist. But if we give in to unbelief, obstinance, failing to step forward with God, it is a path to destruction. It's a path to death. So tonight in closing, I challenge us, like John the Baptist, to recognize when we're going through seasons of question mark, of doubt. Be honest with them. But take them to God. Now, that doesn't mean you don't need to share them with anybody else. Sometimes we need to. But ultimately, take them to God and let God affirm, confirm, bring clarity to his word, his work, and his will. And if and when we do, we're going to find that God, like for John, brings us through, hear this, even if it means our heads removed, he brings us through to his plan, his will, his work. And everyone said, amen. Join me in standing. Father, thank you for your word. May it not return empty. Oh God, help me, help us to not give in to unbelief, but, but to take our doubts, our question marks to the feet of Jesus and sometimes to the saints of God and I pray that we'd find a pathway forward that is faith-filled, that is God-filled. And Lord, may we come through his shining testimonies for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Several of you need to head quickly to the multipurpose building. Then